Now, most of you have, have been aware this week of what's been going on, the, uh, the, the hit song that Jason Aldean has had this week, Try That in a Small Town. I mean, it's top of the charts. It's been a controversial song, too, because of some things. Uh, you know, basically the premise, if you try that in a small town and see how that works. So that's the name of the song, Try That in a Small Town. And it has had such success that they're coming out with a sequel, a sequel song to it uh, for the, uh, it's a, in a gospel version. And so this is it. Look at this picture and you'll see the name. The visitor sits in wrong pew. Try that in a small church. <laughs> Now, I found that online. Some people are awful talented, but they got too much time on their hands. I think of stuff like this. But uh, I don't care where you're sitting. I don't know if you're sitting in somebody else's seat or whatever, how we are funny about those things. We're just glad you're here uh, to be here and part of this assembly today. You know, one of the things I love to do is I love to watch videos of people getting scared. Now, I never enjoyed going to a scary movie. I've just never liked scary movies and being scared myself. But I get too much enjoyment watching someone get scared. You know, there's a thing that goes around on social media. It's called Bushman. And he just he stands on the street, and he's covered in leaves. And he looks like a plant. You know, right, it just right, and right when people get to him, he jumps out, and just men and women, there is some hilarious reactions to people being scared. And I'm sure that you can, just like some people told me after the 9 o'clock service, they can remember some things that always scared them, uh, movies that they still remember today that just really scared them. Now, being, uh, growing up in the church like I did, my mom always had me in church. Uh, we never had a youth minister, but the person was teaching uh uh, you know, our youth group, I remember every once in a while they would do a campfire, you know, and, you know, every, every youth leader at some time or another has had the campfire, and they'll say, they'd say something like, oh, this is what hell's going to be like if you don't give your life to Christ, you know, it just scare you to death, you know, and I remember I would go home after a meeting like that, and I would just go to bed, my eyes were just like this, I couldn't even go to sleep, I was so scared, and then then it'd be some youth rally we would go to, and somebody would talk about the end times and uh, uh, the tribulation and rapture and being left behind and how, how terrible things were going to get. And I, I remember it would scare me to death. And I, like I say, I'd go home, and then I would just say, I said, Lord, I'm going to try so hard to be good. <laughs> you know? And it would, like I say, I couldn't even sleep at night. Do you remember, remember the book? Uh, how Lindsay came, you've got to be old school, remember this, How Lindsay, the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Oh, man, it was, I mean, it was just everything about the end times, and I, I mean, it just always kept me scared. Now, I'm not going to, this is for another discussion. I don't know if those are the right ways you need to teach kids, scaring them to death or not. <laughs> That's for another discussion, but I just remember that. But what if? What if Jesus is coming again? What if Jesus is going to come back? You know, and in this series of where we're doing, we've called What If. We've asked some big questions. We asked, what if Jesus is the only way? And we talked about how we should then live. And last week, we talked about what if heaven is waiting for us? What if we live like people who are heaven-bound? How would we change in how we approach life? And today I ask that same question, what if? How should we live if Jesus is coming back someday? You know, where did we get the idea that Jesus was going to come back? We get it right from him. John 14, 2 and 3 says this. In my Father's house are many rooms. Some, some translations say many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. We got the idea from Jesus. He's the one who said, I am coming back someday. So if, that's, if we believe that, then how should we live? How sh what are some things we need to know? One thing we need to know this is that no one's going to know when it happens. No one knows when it's going to come. Jesus was walking and talking with his disciples, and they were passing through Jerusalem, and they were, they were looking at all the 
tremendous buildings and the temple. And they were talking to Jesus and saying, you know, look at these magnificent buildings. And Jesus then tells them that a day is coming when all of Jerusalem, the temple, will be destroyed. And he was prophesying about when the Romans would come in and destroy Jerusalem. But he also segue into talking about when he would return. And he says this in Matthew 24, 36. He says, No one knows about that hour or that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. But this has not stopped people from trying to pinpoint exactly when Jesus was coming back. I didn't realize this. I thought the uh, return theories and things like that didn't get started till later. But some of the things I was reading this week, as early as 500 A.D., there's a history where people were picking a day. Jesus is going to return this day. And they quit doing everything and just waited for Jesus to come. If you look back in 1914, the founder of what is known as the Jehovah Witnesses, they picked that as when he was going to return. In the 1980s, there was a book entitled 88 Reasons Jesus Will Return in 1988. I bet book sales went down after 1988, don't you think? How about David Koresh and the Branch Davidians? That was all around that they were looking and waiting for the Lord to come back. You probably remember from the news some years ago, a group out in California, Heaven's Gate. And they based that whole thing that Jesus was coming back to get them. And there's been more and more of those like that. They all had one thing in common. They were wrong. They were wrong. But another thing that's in common is every one of them had an idea that even though Jesus said, no one knows but the Father, that we could find a loophole. We could find some kind of hidden meaning somewhere and predict the day that he was coming back. But Jesus is true to his word. When he says no one knows, no one knows but the Father. So we know that. The second thing is we need to pay attention to is that his return will be unexpected and it will be sudden. Matthew 24, 44 says, So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Just from a show of hands, have any of you had your home broken into or a car broken into? Just raise your hand if you have. A lot of people. Now let me ask you this. How many of you think it's a possibility that it could happen to you sometime in the future? Yeah. If you knew when the thief was coming, you could have stopped it. You would have changed your habits. You would have had the police there. You could have stopped it. But the point is, that's not how it works, is it? We don't know when it's going to happen. Four times in the New Testament, Jesus' return is characterized by using the phrase, coming like a thief in the night. Not calling Jesus a thief, but said, that's how sudden, that's how unexpected it's going to happen. You ever remember doing something? You're in the middle of doing something that you shouldn't be doing, and just before you get caught, the person, you know, the teacher, I always think about the teacher is about ready to turn their head and you just pop up just like you're as innocent as you could be. I'm telling you, I made a whole career as a student doing that. <laughs> I'm talking about from all the way through, just acting up, pushing it to the limit, and when they're about ready to get caught, I'm just an angel. You know, that's not going to work. That's not going to work with the return of Jesus. It says that it is, it is sudden. It's going to happen so quickly. It's going to be right there. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says this. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The language is instantaneous. That all of these things happen. There's not, there's not going to be time to fold your hands. Uh, and when you think Jesus is returning, and just, now I'll be down to sleep and pray the Lord my soul to keep. It doesn't work. There's not going to be time. His return is that, uh, that sudden and unexpected. Another thing we learn is it's going to happen on a normal day. And that just goes right along with what we were saying. That if no one knows, 
and it's going to be unexpected, and it's going to be sudden, it would make sense that it's going to be on a normal day. Matthew 24, 37 and 38 says, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. It was just an average day. It was a normal day. It was a routine. Now, I'm not saying it was a godly day. I'm not saying it was a moral day or an uh, ethical day. But it was a regular day. In Genesis 6, God is describing that he looks down upon the earth and he says, and he describes it this way. He said, everything that they can imagine, every inkling of the heart, everything that they can imagine, they're doing. There was no boundaries to the evil and the sin. He said, if they think it, they do it. And he says, I'm going to destroy the earth with a flood because of that. When we look at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, and it says, when God looked down on Sodom and Gomorrah, and it said their evilness was so great that he said, I am, I've had enough, I'm going to destroy them. I'm not saying that we are, that what we see going on in the world today, the evilness and sin, is a precursor to God saying, enough. I did like what one writer said. If the Lord doesn't come back soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But I will say the evilness, the pure evil that we're seeing unleashed in the world today, in our own country, that was unfathomable just 25 years ago. I don't know if you've been to see the movie The Sound of Freedom, but you should. You need to support a movie like that, an effort like that, and how they handle a dark thing that's going on in the world, but they handle it with a lot of class. But the sex trade in the world is the fastest growing international crime in the world. And the United States is the top importer of the kidnapping and forcing in the sex trade. That's an evilness that is beyond, as I say, just sin. The things that we see coming down even from our national leaders who are supposed to be looking in the interest of our own, of the best of the people of the country. There's an evilness. There's a darkness there. And I'll admit that I look and I'll go, Lord, how can you not come back? And the only answer is this. He tell, Simon Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. doing it for us so that some may still repent and come to him he has the patience that I don't have he has the, the forethought that I do not have the grace that I do not have he will come again do not, do not confuse the slowness or his patience or his grace do not confuse that with a failure to fulfill the story of an old farmer that had a grandfather clock in their house and uh, you know how they chime on the hour. And at 12 o'clock one night, it chimed, it went haywire and it chimed 14 times. And the old farmer woke up and said, Nellie, get up. It's later than it's ever been. I feel like that. I don't know. I don't know. Of all the things that we see happening in the world, and there are a lot of educated people, people that I respect a great deal, that say all of the pieces are falling into place for the Lord's return. I don't know. I don't know each of those places. I don't know each of the pieces. But I do know this. Two things. 
It's later than it's ever been. We're closer to the return to Jesus than any other group of people have ever been. And even if we think that we've figured out the, this is the time that he's coming and I, you know, it's got to come soon, just remember what, Je- what the Lord said. To him, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. We don't know when, we just know it is a reality. It's later than it's ever been. One more thing I want us to look at about the return of Jesus, and that is it is going to be spectacular. The first time Jesus came, it was in total obscurity. You cannot think of a more obscure way to come into this world as the Son of God than to come in as a baby in a know-nothing town, born into poverty, and didn't even have a room to be born in. You can't come any more unconspicuous than that, obscure. But take his word for it, that will not be the way it happens next. It will not come that way. Matthew 24, 30 30 and 31 says this, At that time the the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. In verse 31, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one, uh, from one end of the heavens to the other. I don't know if I'd appreciate a friend like this that was in Bible college right before I was there. But they were studying this at, uh, at the time, Roanoke Bible College, studying through this and he had the bright idea that night at midnight, he blew a trumpet in the uh, dorm. <laughs> I, don't know if I, would, I don't know if I would appreciate that or not. <laughs> you know? But this grand entrance imagery that is painted of how Jesus will return is told in multiple places. Jesus himself said this is how it will be. Simon Peter says how this will be. The Apostle Paul mentions this very same thing. And then finally, John in the book of Revelation. The coming of a mighty warrior, a king, a judge to, to, make, to judge the world. From everything that I can see, it is going to be both terrifying and glorious all at the same time. Personally, I think to see it, even though I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, it's going to scare me. But one thing is for sure, as it says, the nations will mourn for those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It will be terrifying. As we read earlier, it's going to be a time of where he gathers his people together. It says he draws them from all points of the earth. And that goes to say, too, is if you gather, you're separating. And there will be some who will be brought in and some who will not. This remains the defining thing that waits us of our time, of all, all creation. It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. So what does it mean? So what is the big what if for today? Well, he tells us that as well in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. He says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought to? you to be that's the what if and he goes on and says this you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed or look forward to his coming that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat this is the what if I can't believe it still exists But one of the inscriptions that is in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. is a quote from the poet Alfred Lord Tennyson. It says this, One God, one law, 
one element and one far off divine event to which the whole creation moves. We are rushing forward. We are moving forward to the greatest divine event that there will be. All of creation will be involved with this day. All creation. So how should we live? He says, holy and godly lives. Paul didn't say, now try to find, or Peter didn't say, Paul didn't say, John didn't say, Jesus didn't say, try to figure out the moment I'm coming. He said, live holy and godly lives and look forward to my return. That should be our response. Holiness is put aside, putting aside the deeds of darkness. Holiness is imitating the character of God. What is God like? You figure it out from studying His Word, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and then you try to be like Him as best you can. Holiness is a positive spirit about God's plan. Peter says, since we are looking for the return, since we're looking forward to His coming, you are looking forward to it, aren't you? Dr. Raymond Edmonds told the story about his family. <clears throat> this was during World War II. That his oldest son, Charlie, was drafted to go into the Navy. And as sad as heart-wrenching, I'm sure that is for a family, for a, a child to be drafted, to be taken in to go to war. His youngest son, Norman, adored his older brother, Charlie. So it was particularly tough on him. But when he, when he went off to basic training, he sent a package back to his little brother Norman, and it was a sailor's cap. And he says, wear this while I'm gone. He says, and every day I want you to wash it out and hang it up to dry. It's not Mama's job. This is your job, Norman. And you keep this clean until I come back. And he did. They said, they would have to make him take it off when he sat down at the dinner table. When he went in the schoolroom, the teacher would have to make him take off his sailor's cap. And he did that. He washed it every night, hung it up in his bedroom to dry. And on nights that he forgot, he would get out of bed and wash it out and hang it up. Well, as it was in that day, they got word that uh, Charlie was going to get to come home for furlough. And, but you didn't know when exactly it was going to happen. And so one night as they were eating dinner, they heard a car door slam and looked out, and it was a taxi, and one of the daughters yelled, It's Charlie! And everybody ran to the door except for Norman, who darted up the stairs. And everybody was hugging Charlie at the door and crying and uh, just laughing, all mixed in together. And Norman finally come running down the stairs, and you know what he had. And he leapt into the arms of his brother. And he said, look, Charlie, I did what you told me to do. And as Charlie held him, he said, Norman, you're a great soldier. I'm going to promote you to lieutenant. You see, one day, one day we're going to have the grand interruption in our life. That we're going to be doing the things that we think are so important, the things that we have to do that are fun, all the things that we're, we just think are so essential. We're going to be doing that, and we're going to be interrupted by the trumpet and Jesus splitting the sky. And we will be met with the words, Well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me. I never knew you. And that's our what-if choice. That's our choice. Don DeWelt, a longtime professor at Ozark Christian College, uh, had in his office, on his desk, a little plaque that just said this, Perhaps today. Perhaps today. Perhaps today. Jesus returns. Perhaps today you make your one if choice. 
to live holy and godly lives. Your what-if choice of giving your life to Jesus Christ today.